Now, I would like to invite the speaker that we have been waiting for and the session uh, which is connected to the theme. Uh, he has been a serial entrepreneur. He is one of the guys in Pune who has been part of the ecosystem right from when it started off in Pune. I used to be sort of, what do you call that, a corporate slave and drop into uh, this place which is next to my place, this invoices place, where we used to hold up sessions. He is also the founder of uh, the Pune Coffee Club, Pune Open Coffee Club, POCC as we know it. And since then, I have been attending those sessions once in a while because IT weekends used to be off, generally. So I used to drop in uh, next to the place and attend and used to see these guys breathing with energy regarding to startups and creating ecosystem and this and that. And this is like a while back, this is like 2008-9. And since then he has been involved with many startups, he has helped many startups with their tech requirements. And uh, to tell you more about his journey, bit of Jack, his present startup which is Nirazin, uh, which you might have seen on the link and more importantly speak about the importance of proof of concept uh, which I am sure you are awaiting. Please help me welcome on stage Santosh Dhamla. Hey everyone, uh, while I am getting set up, should take only a few seconds. Uh, Am I audible at the back? Yes. yes. I don't really need the mic. <laughs> so, as it turns For out. recording sake, I will say, please. Okay, yeah, yeah. we'll do that. Okay. You, usually, if you find him elsewhere, he is a man of very few words. He speaks when it is required, but when he starts speaking, then people listen. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I'm Santosh. We are getting set up here quickly and I think we are good to go. So, any who want to come up on the screen as well. Uh, okay, so I'm ordered at the back, right? I think there's no problem in hearing me. Great. Uh, quick question. Uh, I want to understand what this audience comprises of. How many of you have built a serious product? So you could be part of a company that's building a product that's a small, you know, a team of people. I mean, please put up your hand if you have it. Okay. So the others who have not put up their hand, would it be fair to assume that you've never built anything? Absolutely. <coughs> so would uh, would some of would any one of you just you know stand up and maybe in a minute express your interest? Maybe do you want to build a product? Uh, the gentleman in the pink shirt. Sir, I want to know what is the. Uh... Difference between feasibility study and proof of concept. You want to know the difference between a feasibility study and a proof of concept? Yeah, right. I'm there with the idea. Uh -huh. so I go for a feasibility study or I go for a proof of concept. Okay. Anybody else? By the way, he's a finance guy. So. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I absolutely respect that. See, not everybody comes from a background of engineering or something like that. So, uh, but you still want to be an entrepreneur, so you want to build a product. Right? Anybody else would like to add something? Uh, to that, what is your chief intent in building a product or maybe a challenge that you want to meet? Uh, especially those folks who didn't put up their hand. Anybody would like to say something? Uh, the reason for my aim to build up this product was basically to create an ecosystem. When it is a win-win situation for everyone who comes along. Uh -huh. It's more of kind of a win. Wherein like, your winning is not an option for me, it's a compulsion for me. Okay, you want to build an ecosystem and winning is not an option for you. Okay. For, the, for the person who comes on board, it's like Google. The, the board is with me, uh -huh. the upper layer is open for you. Uh -huh. So you come, you build an Android app. You want to build a platform? We already have that. Okay. We have created a web engine basically. Okay. Okay, that's a very, very high and very ambitious goal. Uh, I may not be able to cover everything. Okay, so when Amit contacted me this time, you know, he asked me, uh, can you help my i trying to see if it comes up here. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Can you 
Okay. So we actually connected, Amit and I connected and he asked me, you know, can you walk the audience through prototyping and early validation? So this is what I focused on. Prototyping and early validation is an area that we focused on. Nevertheless, we can also cover some aspects of MVP or maybe proof of concept as well as someone clearly mentioned, you know, feasibility study and proof of concept. Uh, so feel free to ask me questions, you know, and interrupt me in the middle of the presentation. This is something that I've just put together very quickly. I'm happy to tailor the uh, presentation more towards who your needs. Um, okay, who am I? I Amit gave me a generous introduction, I should say. Uh, yes, I am a man of few words, uh, primarily because I'm an engineer. So, <laughs> So we try, we try to you know show stuff rather than sell it. Like <laughs> uh, I'm Santosh at Dazzle.co.in. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Dazzle, which is basically a platform for small businesses. But before this, I've been a tech entrepreneur. I've built Bookiecy.com, which is Pune's first aggregator. We actually launched a full three months before Book My Show, uh, but we had to pull the plug in 2009 because we couldn't raise funding. And uh, as you all know, 2009 was the death valley for many startups not just mine, uh, but it was a very interesting ride. We actually sold a crore worth of movie tickets and it was the first product that I built with a very small team. Before that, I was part of Persistent Systems and Research in Motion. At RIM, uh, I, the product that we built was actually in use by 300 million people. It was popularly known as the BlackBerry Internet Service, if anybody will remember that. It's almost like an arcade product now. So I'm also an alumni from RIT New York where I have my MS in Computer Science. I'm from University of Pune. I have grey hair. I dropped in at an interesting time in the discussion. Like I was just listening to all the things going back and forth. And as Amit said, yes, I'm a founding member of Pune Startups.org. I did it out of love that yeah, you know, eco, uh, startups and ecosystem should connect. It got to be something much bigger than that. So I said, okay, this is where I probably should draw the line and let the kid go to college. So, <laughs> So now other people are running it. Uh, Pune Startups.org is still growing, but I'm no longer connected. Uh, okay, so that's about me. A couple of days back, actually Paul Graham tweeted out, there are three stages of design and I completely buy this. You know, I'm not because I'm, you know, I idolize Paul Graham, but I think because he's right. First stage, too simple. I think that's what we need to focus on today. Second stage, too complicated. So you go from too simple to too, too, too complicated, and then you go back towards simple because now you know what's essential. So I think this is a very knowledgeable tweet, and I think coming from where he's coming from, we will be focusing on the first stage, how to be too simple. Every prototype must have a hypothesis. So if I went to define a prototype, right? I think the gentleman here is smiling. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Hypothesis is something which is very, I would say, very techy term, which most of the... Absolutely, I'm a, yeah, I'm a science geek. <laughs> would, would you like me to spend some time on what this means? You must want to prove something with that prototype. Otherwise, don't build it. If you're not trying to prove something, what, you know, typically we have this self, uh, self-confidence, right? Are nahi, yaar, wo product bana lenge, that's that's where the trouble lies, I think. Is that fair? Would that be fair? On my side? Yeah. So majorly my problem is not a lot of people uh, understand the meaning of hypothesis and why it is important. Yeah, a I hypothesis is agree. that you want to prove a fact. And what is that? Let's let's examine what those facts are. Like I, so I think I term it uh, sorry. I term it in a way that uh, uh, I am in my current situation. Right. This is my ideal situ uh, situation, and now I am thinking to go towards the next thing, which is your idea. Now, to take a decision whether I should go for the idea or not, I have to have enough evidence. The way we do with a case or something, should I go? And then you do the hypothesis, which is a part of data science. Right. And right. you should do it in that way. Right. It, there has to be strong evidence enough to move from my stay where I'm not doing anything right. to what I'm going to do. So. No, that's actually fair. I mean, see, that's a very fair assumption, but you know, the okay, so very quickly, see, my, why I would do this is why I would suggest you should do this. You're trying to build something, right? Let's not assume users will use it to begin with. Okay? Then when you, when you sit down with that thought, 
that I don't think users are going to use this, you have to actually think about why. Why are users going to use this? And therefore, that is your hypothesis. Or rather, that is what you want to test. Now, let's say you're building a very simple app, okay, and it attempt, it's going to try to achieve something, right? What you really want to do is, you want to reduce that achieve something to a goal or an objective, which you can test through your prototype. Okay, fair enough. Uh, a prototype must be functional in some way. This is this is a nice to have. It's not a must have. As I will demonstrate going further, there are so many ways to twist this. Functional, you know, if you know what I mean, that it actually does something. So, like, say for example, you're thinking I want to build an app, you know, but you could actually do it without writing a line of code. I'll show you how. And in many cases, an MVP is also a prototype. Because prototypes are usually thought of as something which is internally traded. I built it, I showed my friends. I never launched it on the App Store. But many cases, MVPs are also prototypes. What is it? MVP, minimum yes, product. sorry, a minimum viable product. I'm really sorry, please stop me if I use jargon like that. You know, I, <laughs> I tend to assume a lot of things. So MVP is a minimum viable product. It's the least amount of features that you will want to have to prove something that your concept works. Is that not too, I hope it's not too scientific again, you know, it's like, please tell me, you know, if you want me to give examples, I can do that. I'll give you an example of an MVP, right? An MVP of, let's say I want to amplify my voice, right, using a mic. So an MVP is, can I actually do it, right? And then you start with some very simple ideas, but without all the bells and whistles. So for example, this mic that I'm holding in my hand has excellent black chrome finishing. It has excellent black chrome finishing, so it's also accomplishing something aesthetic. Remove it. If it's not essential, you will finally be holding an MVP in your hand. So there are many features that, that, that you can find, that you can remove, once you have done that exercise of removing, that's your MVP. That no, if I must absolutely build these three or four things to prove my concept. Works? Okay, so... <clears throat> so how do you get too, too simple? Now, that's actually a hard job because this is something that I'm trying to succeed at. But I have never succeeded in the last, I don't know how many years I've been doing this. But generally, you know, engineers, you know, we tend to overbuild. <laughs> so what happens is, these are some ways that you can actually come to too simple. First, try to reduce the number of users that it's built for. Typically, hardware, hardware startups will take this very quickly. Let's build one, a unit of one. Let's not go for mass production. Very famous prototype that followed this rule, Apple tablet, Apple iPhone, name it, they've done it. One, they built just one, and they show it to people, they put it in the hands of their CEO, their users, of course a close group, a secret group, and they will not mass produce it generally. They will try to assemble it from off-the-shelf components. So that's the, uh, the user of one concept, I guess you could say. Reduce the time to build. This is something that software guys love a lot. Let's do wireframes, let's do mockups, let's do Clay models, I mean, if you want to demonstrate the user journey, you will use, you, use Lego blocks. Has anybody tried this? Please try it, it's wonderful. Actually take small Lego people, take Lego blocks and try to demonstrate the user journey with those people and those Lego blocks. This is what my user is trying to achieve with my app or my product. I, I think some people are thinking I'm crazy. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that is not the case, but these things actually help, please try it. Reduce the features to build. I just talked about the MVP, that's one more way. Now reduce the performance. This is a very, very interesting kind of angle. Examples are Falcon 1. Everybody has heard of SpaceX, right? But at one point, SpaceX was an underfunded, you know, underdog that is trying to achieve orbital flight. So they built the Falcon 1 to prove that they could take one turn to <coughs> orbit. And now Falcon 1 is now replaced by Falcon 9, Falcon 1 being the proof of concept. So reduce the performance. Let's just identify a black box. If we can do this, we can increase that black box. 
Another one is how do you build a mini Death Star? I think please Google this. It's a wonderful presentation by a physics professor. How do you build a Death Star? So what is the objective of a Death Star? If anyone can fill in the blanks, please. Anyone, anyone geeky enough over here? The objective of a Death Star is to take a planet apart. This is Star, Star Trek, I mean Star Wars. Oh, yes, yes, okay. yes. <laughs> okay, so objective of a Death Star is you take a planet apart. So what does this physicist do? He says, look man, if you need to build a Death Star, first of all you need to come up with the amount of energy needed to blow up a planet. So let's reduce it to one, the one unit. Like how do I remove one kg of, uh, rather, you know, one unit of mass from a planet. And then based on that I will extrapolate and build a Death Star. That can I first produce enough energy to take out one unit of mass? If I can, then I can extrapolate it. Like then I'll figure out how to get the energy. For, okay, I, I think this is kind of <laughs> not connecting at all. Anyway. It's basically scale modeling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Reduce your performance. So let's say for example if you're trying to achieve X, try to do 1 first, then try to do 2, then by induction 1 plus 1 to 2 to N, you know, that's kind of the idea. So why prototype? Because it gives you the ability to imagine, to fill in the blanks. If you leave, left out some information, that's fine. But if you did the core concept of what you're trying to build, it up, gives you the ability to imagine what this can do, what is its potential. Refine the first version you ship. Have you ever heard, uh, you know, entrepreneurs say, "Yeah, first version, assume it's going to be thrown out of the door." That's exactly what happens in the journey of every product. Every product's first version out the door. You have to rebuild it. So, what do you do? You prototype instead. That is smarter. Then you know. Pretending, yar, hum bahut bade, bade company bana rahe hai, or, malab, everybody just jumps in and builds something really huge and then you end up throwing that out. Because then it's like demotivating, right? Yar, energy itna dala hai. So you feel demotivated. But you know, the smarter way to do it is, look man, we are prototyping. But the biggest reason, okay, that I think, because I am an entrepreneur, build what you can sell and not sell what you can build. That's the bottom line. If you know where this quote has come from, it's come from directly from a Lean Startup book. The prototype helps you establish first whether what you're building is indeed wanted. Is there a need that it is satisfying? Fair enough? So how do you use a prototype? Actually, uh, I mean if you're creative, you know you can use it for pretty much anything. You don't just have to circulate it internally. You can validate your pros proposition for your target user. A very great, good example of this is games. So if you've been started, if you've been just looking at how games are built these days, they involve users very, very early on. And the most basic thing that they want to prove is that people will love these games. They will be engaged. And how do you measure engagement? By time spent. So when a game designer finds that, Are, my users are loving this prototype so much, that you know they tend to you know come back they tend to come back spend more time then they go for actual production where they take that game concept i mean if you think about it like you know i mean of course ignoring the games that are copied like farmville and then farmville 2 farmville 3 you know not those kind of games we're talking about the games that are really intelligent really well thought out they are actually built this way these days the users get involved extremely early these are called early access games so that's, uh, that's how you can use a prototype to gather feedback. So you can get feedback, like how do you feel about this product, you know, that's another way to use it. You can even file for a patent, so that's nice if you want to do that, please go ahead. Especially if you're building the Falcon 1. So, and amazingly to raise funding, so we'll look at a case study about, you know, how other startups have done this. Yeah. We started talking about prototypes, right? And I think this discussion is more centered towards a product based. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So I mean, what if a person needs to pitch in and start start a service based sort of a startup? Right. So uh, I mean, I, yeah. how, how does the prototype thing fit in? And okay. you could also rope that in, in as a part Actually, of Actually, very interesting question. I got to be honest, you know, I'm out of my depth. <laughs> in terms of being able to answer that question. But generally services, you know, the best way to prototype them is to start with, uh, again, you know, like say for example there are people in world. So either you take one customer and then you run them by that service. So you have like a visual, let's say you have a visual diagram. 
you know, that they are they're undergoing that journey of a service. So maybe how you know how many few you know how many in less effort how can I make that one customer go through that entire journey? That's typically the drawing board for a services company. Would that be a fair answer? Yeah. Okay. Nowadays you can engage in the beta testing also. Nowadays it's a trend of uh, engaging customers in the early stage development and taking their feedback. So they even go through the journey and you come to know whether the product is getting accepted or not or whether you are over building it. As yes, yes saying, absolutely. Yeah, you and I yeah. and be there as we, we came to know that we have built it around 100 features out of which even 10 are not known to the code. Right. So that's, that's a typical problem with the engineers. Yeah, we always absolutely. end up building yeah. and we know that we are the best and that's the biggest problem. <laughs> I mean with the product you have something to sell, I mean you have something physical yes, to show. Yes, something physical to show. Service. Yes. I think with the service what happens is you know you don't, I mean you have to market yourself really well and yeah. prototype is yeah. not, I mean you don't have a material form of a prototype. No, I, I trying to yeah, no, see, I think the beauty of a services business is that you can actually have the customer go through that entire experience, you know. Uh, so that that is really the framework within which you want to prototype or proof of concept. I think in your case, I yeah, would not I mean, use the word I mean, I'm, I'm trying to visualize how does this whole proof of concept thing work for a service base. Right. It's about customer journeys customer in your case. Yeah, okay. customer journey, like what is the customer experiencing? In fact, that Lego idea is much more valuable to you than to us. Who does he interact with? Okay, he interacts with this. Now, what input and information does he have to go to the next stage? In the next stage, who does he interact with? So, having that de depiction, that visual layout of your customer journey is your prototype. Can I? So, could I share an example? That please, no, no, please. I think. Yeah. So, one of the examples that we I like to share that. I like to give you a test study or the real case example how we are trying to use a prototyping in our journey. So we are a service based company, we are connecting uh, event vendors and users on a platform and in this service journey, uh, journey of service, now when we are trying to move to B2B side also or have a get, a, get a in depth analysis of B2B, we are posing ourselves as an event planner, uh, we are trying to learn the experience and whatever we are we want to build in our product. So whatever we want to build in our product, we are putting it on paper and just see. So we know whatever we are doing it on a piece of paper can be easily taken onto the platform and build as a core offering. So it necessary in the prototyping, the prototyping in our case is that whatever we want to do on web or on platform or on, a, on a anything, we are doing it on a piece of paper as of now. For for me, it helps because I know if it is adding value to the customer or not. Thank you. So I did this for my wife. She is a CA and she is professional, so I can relate it to the services industry. So normally, what I believe it's a common to product and. Uh, the services, the prototyping means you are validating. Okay, so first what we do is like a product, you have a base thing which can be usable. Uh, you take uh, same thing uh, with services that what is the usable service flow. So if I want to serve someone that, okay, he can do audit, just taking an example or in your case something that I want to serve him. So a life cycle from like a patent thing where you are filing, like you are introduced to you are filing a patent to you get your uh, patent approved. Okay, it may be a three years experience. Now, important thing is uh, it's not about only serving one customer. What will happen when 100 customers will come? Now, this comes, you can't test it with 100 customers. So what you do is, if I'm spending, uh, suppose, uh, uh, 100 hours in three years, okay, for one patent, so for serving 100 customers, it will require 10,000 hours, which is not with me. So now you come with the idea how I can serve this 100. So you reduce down your process on the paper. Which standardizes what you are trying to do. So whatever, you are now jotting down where are the bottleneck, how I can reduce. You are not yet in, uh, interacting it with your customer. So you are now prototyping a way that I have to reduce this 100 hours to 10 hours in which I can serve a customer, so I can serve 100 people. Now this is your objective, just giving you an example. Yes. So now you put it on the paper, now you are not going to test it on 100. 
now comes that one user on which you would try that can I now bring it from 100 hours to 10 hours this can be really in the services industry I tried same thing in with my wife so just sharing yeah, the example there's a very interesting book on this topic I mean not exactly this topic but uh, I mean I would like to share it with all of you if you get a chance please do read a book called The Goal I, I forgot the name of the author probably Santosh you might be knowing I don't know I'll ask Google <laughs> oh, you can ask Google yeah I can ask Google too but if you look really. Uh, but then uh, I think it, it has extremely wonderful tips and it is mostly, it is a semi-faction sort of a book uh, and it's... It's Marshall Goldsmith. Okay, Marshall Goldsmith. Is that right? Uh, no, I just... This the Elia Goldrack. Elia Goldrack is the author and right. if you guys get a chance, please do read that book. It's okay. about a client manager's journey who's having a really hard time. He's given a deadline. It's a wonderful book. It's more, more to do with a uh, product based industry and it does tie in all these concepts that okay. we're trying to, you know, probably. But for us, I mean, I'm in a service based industry for the last nine years. Okay. And uh, I mean, for me to, you know, probably think of, you know, starting a new new startup or something, okay. venture on my own. And if I'm going to be some, doing something service based, that's why I, I mean, you know, it, it's just a request to you to probably rope that and factor in into your presentation. That's I will. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I'm sorry if I, it's too yeah, much no, of a stretch. This is very much, you know, from my experience. So, I mean, yeah, okay, but Elijah Goldrand. Ellie Goldrand. Ellie Goldrand. Yes. Okay. The Goal by Ellie Goldrand. It's okay. a wonderful so, if anyone wants to look that up, please do so. And, uh, you know, just my request to all the uh, folks in the audience, when you are speaking, do introduce yourself. Just what's your name and, you know, just to help foster. I mean, I don't know who you all are, so, for my sake. Okay, so what's a wizard of Oz prototype? This is a, actually a kind of prototype which you can do without building anything. And uh, some famous startups have actually employed it and some successfully and some not so successfully. I think Ardwak is an interesting case study. Ardwak is actually a social product like Pora. But before Pora, they, what they intended to do or what they intended to achieve was that they wanted to answer, help you answer your questions, any questions that you might have by looking into your friends of friends and trying to find very relevant answers from that group of people. So, you know, you are traveling to uh, Madagascar and you want to know if anyone's been there. For sure, none of your friends may have been there, but the chances are being higher that maybe some of your friends' friends may have been there. And so th the entire concept was built around this automated artificial intelligent intelligence that would route these questions to the right person depending on the context. That you know, you've been talking about Madagascar on your Twitter channel, let's go connect with that guy and figure out if he can help you. So then you know, of course, that, that was kind of the idea, but the way they started was not with this wonderful AI sitting in the middle, but people, they actually built nothing. They built an interface to ask questions and a human to make a judgment key which of his friends, friends and friends of friends will be the right person to answer that question. I, I, I Please, I may have embellished the story a little bit, but that was the core idea. That they started with humans, they didn't build anything, and eventually, you know, as they, the scale grew, the number of, you know, they, what they wanted to validate was whether people will really want this, which they validated to a certain extent, that yes, people really do want these questions to be answered by someone more knowledgeable than maybe an expert, you know, or rather more subjective knowledge having more subjective knowledge than an expert. So they had actually, they had this concept where people would route these questions, get the answers, and as the scale grew, they increased the, they continued to build automation while they were learning. And finally, the automated AI was much more better and scalable, of course, than the human judgment factor. So they simply replaced their line of humans at the back. And no one knew a thing. <laughs> That was the interesting journey that they had. And uh, I, I guess this is a great example of a Wizard of Oz prototype where they actually even got, you know, they raised money against that um, prototype driven by humans. So if you're thinking of building something, think again. Yeah. Uh, I, I just had a question around uh, the, how do you do this in a typical B2B environment? Uh, right, right. Maybe if you're going Very to hard to pull off. This is easy to do in B2C because customers, you know, consumers don't expect to interact with a person. Yeah. But in B2B, you know, you can't 
I mean, depending on, you know, okay, what are you trying to pull off? Let's ask you that. Uh, see, typically the challenges in B2B environment would be, uh, I think this is, uh, uh, is you don't have that much amount of audience that you can go and talk to. Because primarily if you're part of an engineering department, you are basically right. very much uh, apart from the actual customer, right? See, and, I, uh, and, uh, yeah, that's such a good yeah. point. But if uh, I may interrupt you there, like see, you know, the idea here is that, see, I think B2B startups now, they all have this one common thing between them, which makes them great as well as, you know, poor in a way, uh, that your sales cycle in the initial stage will be very long. But, you know, that's a whole different discussion. I'm not really sure if we should do it within this context. But typically, you know, you would want to look for an accelerator or something like that, which will actually help bridge that gap very quickly. So that you don't have to spend that sales cycle yourself. Because, because the, 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 the information that I have is primarily some research analyst reports, like, okay, this is how... Oh, that, those are the worst places to start. Yeah, so, that's what, that's right. what so actually, you know, you will see the history of B2B startups in Pune, the best ones were always started when one of the guys, one of the founders was spending time actually selling a service. And then he realized, man, this could be a great product. And he left that company and started his own company to build that product. Uh, Dhruva is one example. Uh, again, this is again based on what I know and what I've done. Suvida. Suvida is another example. Okay. Um, Quick Heal, Quick Heal is another example. So this gentleman, uh, who the founders of Quick Heal, the Kathkar brothers, they were selling copy machines and PCs. And the customers they would sell their PCs to would always come back and say, I the virus hai. So they went and wrote Quick Heal. I think that's a very oversimplification of their journey, but this is indeed what has happened. <laughs> so, you know, having that experience, like if you have, if you are already positioned in a very interesting job, which is B2B in nature, and your customer keeps complaining about something, and if you would just solve this problem for me, I would pay you a lot of money. That's a wonderful place to start. Because the number of companies, yeah, sorry. And I'm just trying to add on this. Basically, for the B2B solution, one needs to understand, first is the product, what you're trying to work on. Whether there is a need for it or not. That's the primary. Secondly, you have to identify the pain point in the B2B industry. There are so many uh, procedures and process, if you can outlook, on that and then offer your product. Now that's one viable way of entering into the B2B market. Yeah, so that's what uh, the, 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 the insights which you can get is, again, you don't talk to people, right? But primarily, uh, the, 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 the secondary uh, research material that is available online, let's say. No, right. There's other way offline. I'll just. I'm sorry. I'm. I'm extending your. Oh, right, uh, right. Session. For example, in our case, we. I'm, I'm working on a print industry project. So, again, our clients will be like Airtel, Lisa, Bacardi, and Co. And they are big, huge MNCs. At the same time, we have HP, which is like uh, undisputed leader in technology and graphics. What we try to do is neither of them were ready to entertain us because they already have an established chain of supply chain management and the procurement systems, and they already have registered vendors, and there's some very high <coughs> parameters to get into the system. So what we did is we, we try to do an analysis and understand from the vendor's point of view what is the pain point from them, from the company's corporate point of view, and from the manufacturer's point of view, the equipment seller. And that is where we studied their entire cycle, how they work. And then how can we shorten, as truly that gentleman said, it's all about reducing the time frame, the travel time from point A to point B. Every corporate today, I'll say in B2B is a very lucrative market. I would say it's a virgin market, untouched market. If you can tap that, with a good product and you can reduce their time frame, there's a plenty of money there as compared to B2C. So, so the, the, the things that you said about, you hypothesized, hypothesized, uh, what is the name, I don't know. Uh, basically, you have to take hypothesis lenge, based on your in, in input gathering from several teams, as you said. We went on the field, we <laughs> met the people, yeah. we met the, if you're from a company, you're from a procurement department, we took your appointment um, in your free times, wherever it was possible to get, catch you. We went there, we understood your journey, your problems, same from the printer's point of view, same from the manufacturer's point of view. Like companies like HP, they entertained us because technology, they are very advanced in technology. But there was no tracking system on that. We tried to give them some kind of a win-win situation there. From a printer's point of view, we pushed the job to them. And from the company's point of view, we reduced the procurement time. We made it a high-put Actually, product specific. Yeah, so you, you have to identify product. Yeah. That's it. I think I Actually, some of that answer may also satisfy the gentleman who talked about the feasibility study. So that is also, you know, in a way, it is a feasibility study. Can this actually be done? Okay, anyway, let's go. Moving on.
So uh, I'm now going to quickly go to the early validation part. Uh, two ways. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on quantitative, but what I'm really trying to do with quantitative validation is, when you set your hypothesis, you remember the earlier slide where we talked about that, uh, the, basically what you're trying to prove, you, if, if that uh, thing that you're trying to prove is quantifiable, can it, basically it means that you can put a key metric against it. So for example, the game developer uh, argument that I, uh, example that I placed in front of you, how much time are my users spending on my game? That's the simple metric that you would use. So that's your quantitative method of validation. And there's of course a qualitative method of validation which I anticipate most of you will be using. Uh, what's the key emotion that helps validate your hypothesis? I think this is a very relevant way of putting it at, you know, putting things together. I know the B2B guys will say our emotions have no place in B2B sales. But look, man, look for impact. Okay, if not emotion, at least impact. Okay, so basic principles of setting up a user session where you want qualitative validation. Set up the context, write down like a one pager, what are you trying to achieve by getting users to use your product? What are you looking for? Is there something specific that you're looking for? Recruit the right candidates. They should be in your TG. I know many people will want to skip this because you know it's hard work. <laughs> As the gentleman said, B2B means <laughs> please don't do that. Don't skip this step. Recruit the right candidates. They must be in a decision making function, at least in if you look at it from a B2B point of view. And if you look at it from a B2C point of view, they should be in your TG, your target demographic. Do at least six such tests. I am saying at least the recommended number is six because this actually came from a usability uh, you know, sessions uh, advice list that you should at least have six users. The reason why they suggest six is because after the fifth user or the sixth user you learn less and less such that that learning is almost invaluable. I mean, so not valuable. So you might want to do up to six and then leave it there, but since you're doing prototype testing, you're doing hypothesis testing, you might want to go further because you may not have found that click. Right? Yeah, these guys love the product. Or they might hypothesis is valid. So uh, do at least six, do more. <clears throat> How do you conduct a test? Introduce your app or your product and the task that is to be achieved and nothing else. Don't help the user beyond that put the product in their hand, tell, tell them before they begin the test that they cannot go wrong. The app is being tested, not you. So <laughs> please use the app. If you fail, it's okay. I will not count that. I will count that the app has not guided you properly. Have them speak aloud when they're using the app. This is actually very helpful. What are they thinking? And record it. Look for moments when they are confused, hesitant or unclear and not capture those moments. Those are the areas where your usability is failing, uh, but also look for impact at the end. So this is just something that I would like to share, that this is something you can implement. So with that, I want to conclude this. Uh, it was hopefully a useful presentation. Uh, and uh, please uh, share any questions that you may have. We can take them now also, I think, but most of the questions seem to be exhausted. Anyone? Something about your own product. I mean, like we have not known about that. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I can actually quickly do a demo. So what is what is what does Dazzle do? Dazzle actually intends to help. Uh, I mean, everyone has a newspaper guy, a beautician. They don't accept cash. Sorry, they will not accept anything but cash. They are unorganized. They do everything either on maybe you know if they are really a little bit organized, they will do it on paper. They'll give you a paper bill. We are actually trying to change that. We are trying to get these guys on the digital freeway. And how we are doing that is through this platform that we have created called Dazzle. It supports more than 250 <coughs> different types of businesses. Um, all of these businesses have different requirements. For example, beauticians want to manage their time. Newspaper guys want to manage subscriptions. Uh, the retailers just want to do over-the-counter payments and they want to track you know, how much money came in through cash, how much money came in through uh, uh, digital channels such as credit card, debit card. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to build an all-encompassing solution that will help those guys manage their interactions with customers. What we assume is we assume that the uh, 
basically our user journey is as follows like the seller the person who's setting up the business on dazzle he goes he downloads dazzle he sets up his business and once he set up his business on dazzle uh, he will then use that app to collect money from his customers so some of his customers may or may not have dazzle but most of the features are available if the customer also has dazzle um, now why is this really important i think the way we are doing it is very different we are not doing it as a marketplace so urban clap for example is a marketplace we are not doing it like that we are actually doing it as it's a personal technology so it's your app which you're giving to your customers it's not white labelable white labelable but uh, you don't have to work for someone else that's the kind of idea that we are trying to pursue the reason why we are doing it is because we want to create a peer system where you determine your prices and who you sell it to and we don't want to just simply take your customer and send them somewhere else so that's the kind of approach that we are taking which is different from the marketplaces out there <coughs> just quickly uh, set up a demo i need two phones for this uh is what would it sound like to download dazzle and try it okay great so i have a volunteer and we're going to do a user testing so that's <laughs> pretty slow that work on watch it uh yeah i think anyone from i anyone using an idea use any idea user here so yeah uh, do you have an android app please look for d e a z z l e on the android app store android please yeah play store d e a z z l e We need to finish this demo within the next 10 minutes, so we try to do that. Done. Okay. Now you need to do a registration. So let's say she's my customer. Okay, I am a seller, and she is my customer. Yeah, she is about to register with her Refer mobile number. Refer yeah, that you can leave blank. Uh, I haven't set up one yet, but I would love to do so so that you can refer that you have come in through me. Okay. There's a call. Call me with the OTP function that you can try. Okay, while she's just getting set up, I'm, I'm also getting set up on my end. Uh, yeah. No, we are working on it. Just give me a second. Like, please setting this up. Try blue or black. Okay, great. I think now you should be able to see my phone. Yes. So now this is the seller's phone. Uh, he is going to go and quickly create a business. So he goes to my business. Says no business found. And just give me a second. Okay, great. Now I can add a new business. Oh, by the way, I should also explain. We are connected to the Deyasra Foundation, which is uh, they are our parent company. the deyasra foundation specializes in creating entrepreneurs we specialize in connecting them now i'm going to say add a business okay yeah now i need both my hands to do this so i'm going to be the mobile repair guy you know that guy who does your battery and display replacement when you drop your phone So now I've created my business, and it's asking me for referral code. Okay, great. My business is set up. 
Now, what a seller can do is he can do a number of different things such as add a service. So I'm going to add a service which is a battery replacement. And your battery is going to die soon. <laughs> so you'll have to come to me. <laughs> That's kind of an idea. So I'm going to save that as a service. Now that's a service that I've just added. I can add more services if I want to, but I'm going to for the interest of time. Now I say I could I can also add a payment gateway, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, let's say if I've already signed up with Insta Mojo, I could actually add that so as to be able to collect digital money. Uh, it's very easy to sign up with Insta Mojo. You just need a PAN number, go online, sign up, and then come and authorize us over here. That since we are pre-integrated, we will use your Insta Mojo account to debit and credit uh, your account. <clears throat> okay, now under operations, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select uh, issuing direct receipt. These are some of the library functions that we have, <coughs> which match to different kinds of businesses. For example, we have appointments for beauticians. You can also send an invoice. I'm going to turn that on. We issue collect payment. And receive, please select appointment. Okay, hang on a second. Why do I have to do that? There are still some interesting glitches. So I can also enable subscriptions if I'm a newspaper guy. So right now I think I've basically got the functions that I need. So I can add employees if I want, but this is optional. I'm going to skip this. And now I'm going to add her as my customer. What's your number which you registered with? 9028. Just hang on a second. I'll just add you quickly. Yeah. Your name? Neha. 9028. Double two. Double two. Eight nine. Eight nine. Seven nine. Seven nine. Okay. So once, so I can actually import my entire address book. Okay. This is just a manual customer that I've added. There you are, Neha Bizar, right? Yeah. I think it's picked up your registration on Dazzle. So now assuming I have her on Dazzle as well, so I can actually ask her for things like, you know, okay, uh, can you, yeah. Yeah, so I can collect money from here, for example, and uh, if I had enabled that function to send an invoice properly, I would have actually, let me go back into that. She gets the invoice on her, her Dazzle phone and she's attempting to pay it. She actually goes through an online payment experience. And uh, we are now also, now in addition to this, we are also going to give you a quick pay function where Neha can simply say, I want to pay the mobile repair guy and she can actually do that um, digitally. So you don't need to send an invoice and collect it. So the customer needs to be added initially before uh, to the service provider. Right, right. So I, yeah, basically it's like WhatsApp, right? Like the idea is that we want to connect. What do we know about each other? The phone number. So it's I'll assume that. Yeah. It's in the known group, basically. Yeah, yeah. So I have a, I have a set of trusted users. I can pull them in, and once I've pulled my contact book in, I can send them offers. I can send them collect money requests. So is this something like credit note app? Credit note app. Uh, From Mind Train to your technology. Mind. Okay. Maybe similar. I mean, I, w I wouldn't know. I haven't tried them, but the customer has to have this app. Need not. Uh, if she hadn't had it, she would have got an SMS saying that you can pay using this link. Okay, that's so yeah. And why I don't have to install that app if I don't want. As a customer. Yeah, you don't have to, but it's nicer yeah. and have a lovely time. But as a customer, you can force a customer. See, business yes. has no, reason. No, there's to no actual. Yeah. Right. So there's no traditional uh, business in this. If I want to find you, what is the way to do that? Right. So we are going to give you a direct research where we have vetted businesses. Right now we don't have that, we haven't, we haven't vetted the businesses. 
We have about 500 businesses who have signed up. <coughs> so some of those will be curated and then shared with you through a directory. So you can actually look for businesses so if you really want suggestions. When I use the link for payment, it will take me to my ICICI direct and it will be paid through that internet net banking. banking. If you pick net okay. banking, yes, that would be the case. Had you picked credit card, you would have just been given a credit card box. Okay. Uh, or debit card. Uh, actually, it's good news for me. Uh, <laughs> How soon? We have... Huh? How soon? <laughs> I should be paid for that. <laughs> no, uh, because we provide spa services at home. So, this will be helpful for us. Absolutely, yes. yes. So I want to know more yes, so about it. Very quickly, Dazzle is free to download. In number, any number of your customers can download it. You can download it. You don't pay us anything, which is surprising, but we are really deferring revenue for usage. We want you to use it. The only charges that you pay are payment gateway charges when you actually collect money digitally. Okay. One good question. Uh, whoever enter this Dazzle and scan, we can see the, we can make a database. Yes, yes, so typically if you have... So I can send offers to all. Yes, yes, you can actually send a broadcast. So like what you can do is like there's a broadcast function that we've given you here. So I only need ask how many customers here. <laughs> 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 no, I mean whatever number I have, so yeah. only it will be visible. Whatever numbers you have, only those will be visible, yes. I, I am able to see some Supriya here. Right, because she's she's your colleague and she's also using uh, somehow you have her number in your address book. Okay. And she's been using Dazzle. Okay. So. So she is not question. running a business. No, she may not be running a business, but she may be a fellow uh, user of Dazzle, which, okay. which you can also send collect money requests to. So if you want to do peer to peer payment, okay. you know, yeah, I mean, if you want to spend money and stuff, you can do it if you want to. And tomorrow, if she does want to start, she already has a ready customer base. Okay. So, Which is? Yeah. Uh, if somebody, uh, my list is not in Right. So uh, he is in Dazzle. So I can see him as well. Yes. Yes. If you have that contact in your address book, that's the only provision. <laughs> your purpose is not served. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If you're, if you're going fishing for customers, we can help you with that, not through the app, but in other ways. So please do get in touch. We will set you up. That's not a problem. I mean, we are very eager to have sellers, so that service we can extend in the initial stages where we can help you get customers as well who use Dazzle. So, so uh, the payment gateway will be between the customers and the seller? Absolutely. All payments are between you and your customer. So, how will you yeah. be getting... Uh, yeah, as we said, we are not charging you anything. We want you to really use the app. We want this technology to proliferate. That's what we want to do. There's no revenue model right now. As of now. Yeah, I mean, we already know that. Uh, it's a very good point. If we wanted to, we could collect money. But since, you know, we really believe that sellers, for the next three years, we have decided not to do that. Uh, we really believe that the sellers should embrace digital. So us adding a charge is really not going to help anyway. Yeah. I think whatever's happening right now, you will also agree that, you know, we need people to be able to collect digitally money. We are you may not... Modi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> so, uh, one of the visionaries behind this company, Anand Pandey, he is the UIDI uh, temporary, sorry, the uh, part-time panel member of the UI, UIDAI committee. And uh, this is uh, his vision, Dazzle is his vision. I've been working with him for the last two years on this. Um, and our intention is to really help proliferate this technology uh, so that you know it comes into use and uh, you know we don't have to unnecessarily go through this demonetization exercise every time someone prints fake currency. So, yeah. You have, uh, you can build extra business models. Yeah. As per, as per our requirement. Like yes, we yes. We want uh, service as well as right. we want uh, field staff automation. Uh, to a certain extent, we will do it. Our, our, only principle, right. our only principle is that if more than one category can use it, we will do it. Okay. So if, if that is well, a, we, are, we are looking for something which is uh, a, a complete solution uh, right. for uh, marketing as well as uh, inquiry let's, let's and discuss, invoicing yeah. and also the field automation. Let's discuss your requirements. If it's something that many of our customers can use, we will definitely do it. And then you can deploy it as well. So for us to implement a new workflow, it's not it's a trivial effort, we'll do it. The same for us. Yeah. We are coming up with the education uh, startup. So, so 
Okay. To reach out the, the parents. Right. We can do help. Yeah, we can help you with that. We will give you a survey with yeah. the schools also. Okay. Sure. So uh, what we can do is, uh, unfortunately, we have a hard stop at 1:30. That is what the time allowed by the venture centre for us. But uh, I guess you'll be around for at least five ten minutes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, do connect with him offline and. Uh, Thank you. For the live demo and for all the things that he imparted, some uh, knowledge dissemination. Uh, thank you, Santosh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.